The Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy cemented itself as one of the most beloved shows during Cartoon Network's golden age in the early 2000s. And even now, the show is still one of the weirdest and most wonderful shows Cartoon Network has ever produced. The show shot to stardom, from its humble beginnings as grim and evil, heading straight for success and never looking back. Well, until today. We're going to be covering the series from start to finish, so sharpen your sides and smash that subscribe button. Now let's get ready for some cartoon chaos. But before we get all spooky and supernatural, let's give you a rundown of the need to knows. And where better to start than our title characters? This is Billy, a happy-go-lucky, lovable idiot who's best friends with a girl called Mandy. Mandy is the yin to Billy's yang, a mean-spirited, intelligent girl who treats her friend Billy like a lapdog. Our third and final titular character is, of course, Grimm. Now, obviously, Grimm is the Grim Reaper, a figure who strikes fear into everyone he meets, apart from Billy and Mandy, who, after winning a wager, now have Grimm as their best friend forever. But more on that later. Oh, and he has a thick Jamaican accent. Forgot to mention that. These three live in a town called Ennsville, a town plagued with supernatural activity. So, using Grimm's never-ending abilities, they tackle anything that comes their way. All right, I think that's the basics covered. Don't worry, there's a lot more to learn along the way. Now let's dive into a full recap of the Grimm adventures of Billy and Mandy. Happiness is a waxen two-headed baby. The first episode, Meet the Reaper, starts with Billy playing with some toys in his backyard, but his childish fun is soon stopped, though, when Mandy appears and starts to melt his toys with a magnifying glass. How are you today, Mandy? She tells Billy she wants to see his pet hamster, Mr. Snuggles, as it's his birthday. Billy tells her that he's turning 10. That is an old hamster. He tries to get Mr. Snuggles to do a trick by saying, kiss, kiss. Well, more of an attack than a trick, but seriously impressive still for a hamster that old. One foot in the grave and he's still trying his best. The trick was a step too far for Mr. Snuggles, though, as it summons the Grim Reaper. Yeah, the first time we meet Grimm is because of a hamster. A confused Billy mistakes Grimm for Santa as he goes over to claim his hamster's soul. Grimm tells Billy he has to take Mr. Snuggles away, but nothing really gets through to him and Grimm is very confused as to why the kids aren't scared of the presence of the literal Grimm Reaper. I'm a walking skeleton. Isn't that scary? Mandy tells Grimm that whilst she respects someone of his stature, she still won't let him take Mr. Snuggles. You'd normally say that's unrealistic, but she's so intimidating. Grimm then loses it with the pair and demands they hand over the hamster. But Mandy stops him by saying she wants to make a deal. Her and Billy versus Grimm in a game. And if he wins, he gets to keep Mr. Snuggles' soul. But if they win, they get to keep Mr. Snuggles. Grimm becomes so overconfident that he adds that if the kids win, he will become their best friend forever. Grimm takes them to Limbo, where they play Limbo. And just when Grimm is about to win the game, he asks Mandy if she has any last words, to which she says, kiss, kiss, triggering Mr. Snuggles to attack Grimm and causing him to lose the game of Limbo and losing the deal with Billy and Mandy, making him their best friend forever. Yeah, and now you're our best friend forever! The episode Skeletons in the Water Closet introduces us to Billy's mom and dad, so we can finally see where Billy doesn't get his brains from. The episode starts with Billy's mom, Gladys, doing a spot of spring cleaning whilst Billy's dad, Harold, is fast asleep. She goes to wake Billy up only to find Grimm is in his bed. This scares her to the point of insanity, and she basically has a nervous breakdown at the sight of a living skeleton in her son's bed. And to be fair, who wouldn't? Gladys goes straight to the kitchen to tell Harold that Billy is transformed into a big, spooky, scary skeleton. The pair then rush back to Billy's room, only to find that he's sat safe and sound in bed. When his parents leave, Grimm asks Billy if his house is always this crazy, and hopes that nothing else like that happens whilst he goes in the shower. Well, if that ain't tempting fate, I don't know what is, Grimm. And of course, as soon as Grimm steps foot into the shower, Gladys opens the bathroom door to see the silhouette of a showering skeleton. She goes in for a closer look, ripping back the curtains to show a naked Grimm. Gladys once again screams and runs out of the room, only for Billy to quickly take Grimm's place in the bathroom. I feel so, so violated. 
Just in time for Harold and Gladys to come bursting back in with the flail? Harold sees once again that his house isn't being invaded by a skeleton, and assumes his wife has gone a little crazy with being overworked and not getting enough sleep, so he puts her to bed to get some rest. Gladys starts to rationalize things, and thinks maybe what she's seen has been in her head all along. Mandy then rings the doorbell and comes into the house to talk to Grim and Billy to see what they want to do. And of course, they want to play hide and seek, and Grim is it. Meanwhile, Gladys starts to spiral in bed, worrying about Billy's safety, so she decides to take matters into her own hands and starts to look for Grim. Gotcha. <laughs> oh, shut up. She finds a large figure standing behind the curtains, only to find Billy standing on Mandy's head. The relief that her son is safe and sound comes to a halt, though, when she gets a bony tap on the shoulder to reveal Grim. This sends Gladys over the edge to the point she has to go and stay with Harold's sister, Sis, to try and get a little bit of respite. And that was a single day with Grimm in the house. In the episode Opposite Day, it's Opposite Day. No, but seriously, the episode starts with Grimm and Billy knocking on Mandy's door to see if anyone's in. Mandy opens the door and tells the pair that no, no one's in and for them to go away. Billy hears this and rushes into the house, but Grimm tries to leave not understanding why he's been told to go. Mandy stops him and tells him that today is Opposite Day. Mandy explains the rules to Grimm, but he quickly forgets what day it is when he tells Mandy that he doesn't want to do all her chores. Meaning he does. So a beaten Grimm goes to the kitchen to do Mandy's dishes. Okay, this is getting boring. Let's go torture the Grim Reaper. Okay. He then starts work on her lawn, finally completing all of Mandy's chores and the three sit down for some food. Billy asks Grimm would he like some ketchup, and of course he says no. So Billy pours nearly the entire bottle over Grimm's food. You know, as an evil overlord, you'd think he'd know the rules of opposite day by now. Well, maybe I spoke too soon. Because when Billy tries to grab a slice of pie, saying how much they deserve it, Grimm snatches it, saying if they said that, because of Opposite Day, they don't deserve it. But Mandy says, well, if it was Opposite Day, that means when she said it was Opposite Day, it means it wasn't Opposite Day. And Grimm does a fantastic impression of me trying to explain all of this. The episode Get Out of My Head starts with Billy and Grimm watching a scary movie. Billy finds it a little bit too scary, so switches the movie off, but wonders if Grimm can fly into people's minds and control them, just like in the movie. Oh, please. I've seen scarier stuff in your toilet. Which, of course, he can. He flies into Billy's cat, Milkshake's head, and makes her do this memorable dance routine. I'm a kitty cat. I wear a bow. For a hat. After seeing what Grimm can do, Billy tries to learn to jump into people's minds and control them just like Grimm, but just keeps jumping on his dad's head butt first. Grimm tells Billy that he's doing it all wrong, and he has to jump in head first. So of course he visits Mandy to test it out, and it works. <laughs> this episode is also the debut for Billy and Mandy's only other friend, Irwin. Now he's not in this episode long, but remember him as you'll be seeing a lot of him. Billy, whilst in the mind of Mandy, starts to cause havoc, telling Irwin that he's a cutie, telling Mandy's parents she loves them. Feeling all right, Mandy? And even going back and forth between men and women's toilets. Billy stays in Mandy's mind for too long, though, whilst completing all of his normal stupid activities and falls off Mandy's bed, hitting his head and releasing him from her mind. A rightfully raging Mandy demands Billy leave her house, and he wastes no time running away. Later that night, whilst he's in bed, Billy is talking to his cat Milkshakes, saying he hopes he hasn't upset Mandy when all of a sudden, Milkshakes' head turns to reveal Mandy has taken over her mind, and is about to use her razor-sharp claws to give Billy some much-needed payback. In the episode Fiend is like friend without the R, Billy is playing with toys of his favorite superheroes, the Dino Benoids. The toy in question is a frisbee, which he launches into the town dump when trying to find his toy. Grim, Billy, and Mandy find a large hole that seems to travel thousands of miles down. Billy gets taken down into the hole by an unknown force, and when the remaining two inspect the mysterious hole, they too get dragged down by sentient vine-like creatures. Oh, shut up. They arrive at the bottom of the hole, 
to find Billy safe and sound, but also wrapped up in the sentient vines. Wondering where they are, the three are interrupted by a maniacal laugh. The maniacal laugh of Nurgle, or to give him his full name, Nurgle Adam Nurgleton Sr. Nurgle is a demon from the center of the earth. He's one of the most wicked villains in all the show, and he's riddish. Nurgle tells the trio that he's been watching them all for a long time, and after living in the center of the earth for eons, that he's grown lonely and wants to keep the kids as his own best friends forever. forever. <laughs> Grimm jumps at the chance to get rid of Billy and Mandy, leaving them with Nurgle as he teleports back to the earth's surface to enjoy life without the trouble-causing pair. Meanwhile, back down below, Billy and Mandy are trying to plot a way back home, but Nurgle has put a stop to it, trapping Mandy indefinitely in his snake-like tentacles. Grimm is finding life without the kids to be a bit empty, stumbling into Billy's room and finding his dino benoid toys which remind Grimm of what friendship means, which is quite touching for the Grim Reaper. This realization brings Grimm back down to the center of the earth as he tries to break the kids free from Nurgle, but just ends up getting electrocuted into a pile of bones. Nurgle then uses every tentacle to grab all of Grimm's bones, electrocuting each one, freeing Mandy to walk up to him and kick him in the knee, allowing the three to go home safe and sound. Hey Mandy, that was a neat idea kicking Nurgle in the shin like that. Continuing on from early season 1 episode Skeletons in the Water Closet is the episode Grimm vs. Mom. Yeah, you guessed it, Gladys is back. And the first thing Harold does is introduce her to Grimm. This won't end well. Pleased to meet you, Grimm. Gladys reluctantly lets Grimm stay, but all the while is completely on edge over the safety of Billy. We don't put our elbows on the table. And decides to confront Grimm for kicking her out of her own house, and an all out battle between Gladys and Grimm breaks out. Which Gladys wins? Honestly, Grimm is at an all time low here. Billy and Mandy find Grimm in a pile of bones and take him back upstairs to try and put him back together, where Grimm declares that this is far from over. She may have won the battle, but she hasn't won the war. I have a feeling this won't be the last time you see Grimm and Gladys go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. In the episode Something Stupid This Way Comes, Billy and Mandy are bored, having a water fight when suddenly a gigantic clown head and what looks like a carnival appears from out of the earth. A familiar voice rings throughout Ensville. The voice is soon revealed to be Nurgle. He's back. Hello, it's you. Nurgle. And he wants another friend. They confront Nurgle to tell him what they think of him and his carnival plans. But Nurgle insists that all he wants is a friend for life, as he's never had one and is very lonely. Even I feel sorry for him now. Well, so does Billy, who tells Nurgle that he's going to help him make a friend using the five C's of friendship, which are cleanliness, consideration, compliments, conversation, and the fifth and final C, sharing. That mirror makes you look perfectly hideous. These are Billy's rules, after all. The five C's don't do Nurgle any good, who begs Grimm to tell him how he managed to get his friends. And Grimm obviously tells him that he didn't want them and he's forced to be their friend for eternity. It's true! He is our friend slave. Nurgle gets the wrong idea and thinks that he must force people into being his friend too. So he zaps everyone in sight with his tentacles, creating Nurglelings, even zapping the viewer. Is everyone feeling friendly? The episode Haas Delgado, Spectral Exterminator, introduces us to one of the most beloved side characters in the show's history, with the same name, Haas, Haas Delgado. He is a muscular supernatural hunter who wants to rid the human world of anything out of the ordinary, which is rich coming from a hulking man with long ginger hair, an eye patch, and a cybernetic weapon replacing his hand. Summer. One man. One decision. Oh, yeah. One. The episode starts with Haas Delgado introducing himself. Hey, he does it better than I can. So, here he is trying to get a free hot dog. Meanwhile, Grim, Billy, and Mandy are on a school field trip to the museum. And luckily, that's just where Haas is, too. Haas spots Grim getting off the bus and thinks he's about to hit the jackpot if he can wipe out the Grim Reaper. Let's go! <laughs> 
Haas only gets so far in finding Grimm and stumbles upon one of Billy's school friends, Puddin. Interrogating him on the whereabouts of Grimm and Puddin wastes no time in spilling the beans, telling Haas he's friends with Billy and Mandy. Grimm is with the kids at the dinosaur exhibition using his supernatural powers to make the dino bones dance. Haas Delgado spots Grimm singing and dancing dinosaurs and thinks he's trying to raise an undead army, so jumps quickly into action. Delgado. Haas Delgado. Haas's plan quickly backfires, though, as one of his chainsaws ricochets and saws through his cybernetic hand, leaving him wide open for a falling dinosaur bone. But as the ever-ready professional fighter Haas is, he has another attachment on hand. Get it? This one's a metal fist, but he still can't nail this man. So he produces a hand-sized ectoplasm cannon to fire at Grimm, capturing him. Haas tells Grimm that he's going to send him back where he came from, and Grimm is ecstatic, begging Haas to do it, which causes Haas's mind to break. Grimm tells Haas that the kids have him hostage, which puts Haas in hysterics. He figures Grimm's fate is far worse now than anything he could do to him. So he quickly leaves as other supernatural villains are out there waiting for Haas Delgado. Big time critter to his knees. Like this werewolf. The episode Two Eris Human introduces us to another one of the show's most loved supporting characters, Chief Mischief Maker and the Goddess of Chaos. Yes, this is the first appearance of Eris. Eris uses her cosmic powers and abilities to warp reality into, well, chaos. She does this best when using the Apple of Discord, her signature weapon. She's dangerous, she's crazy, but at least she's not boring. The episode starts with Grimm and Mandy in the mall looking for food when Grimm notices Eris sitting by herself causing chaos. How do me look? Is me hair okay? Does me breath smell? What do me do? Eris sees Grimm and comes over to talk to him and asks about who Mandy is. So, when did you have a kid? Oh, uh, what kid? Mandy tells Eris that she tricked him into being her friend forever. This is music to Eris's ears and she knows an apprentice when she sees one. So asks Mandy if she'd want to accompany her in causing chaos and destruction. And obviously, Mandy says yeah. Before the two leave, Grimm tries to hit on Eris, who just humiliated Grimm for being a bag of bones, and the girls go on their way to cause mayhem. How cliche. Well, what that guy got that I don't got? Eris shows Mandy the ropes. Like rule number one, everyone's a target, and that her apple of discord can morph into any situation to make it more chaotic, like turning into a skateboard. Mandy is quickly brought down a peg, though, by Eris, who uses the apple on her and reminds Mandy of rule number one. She tells Mandy that this was all an elaborate prank, and that she doesn't need anyone by her side, and walks away. A furious Mandy goes back to Grimm when Billy shows up and gives her an idea about going to see a movie. Mandy goes to see Eris and tells her that Adonis wants to meet her in the movie theater, and she falls for it hook, line, and sinker, kissing who she thinks is Adonis but is actually Grimm. Remember the number one rule, Eris. I've never washed this cheekbone. No, I never will. The episode Little Rock of Horrors, man, I love these titles, is one of the most loved episodes in the entire series. And it's not hard to see why. The episode starts with Billy trying to find someone to play with, but everyone he speaks to is busy. Grimm, Mandy, Irwin, they're all too busy. A sad Billy wishes upon a star for someone that he can play with, and his wish becomes a reality. From outer space, a meteor hits Earth, and there's something special about it. It's alive and singing. By the way, this is one of the best villain songs in any cartoon. Don't be frightened by the look in my eye. I'm just your average evil meteor from out of the sky. Honestly, we can't do it justice here. You just gotta go and listen to it. The meteor tries to harvest Billy's brain, but of course can't find anything. He asks Billy to help him find some food because traveling to this planet has left him very hungry and he needs brains. Billy doesn't bring him the brains he's after, so the evil meteor tells Billy to bring down people one by one and he'll do the rest. So Billy goes around town, Go down to Mr. McGee's. He hasn't had a thought since 43. bringing everyone he can think of to his new out-of-space friend, feeding the people of Ennsville to him, even his parents. With everyone's brains in town harvested, the meteor is still hungry, and has a hunch there's someone Billy's trying to protect. And there she is, Mandy. But Mandy is way ahead of Billy, and comes down to check what all the chaos is about. The evil meteor takes Mandy's brain, but bites off more than he can chew as it kills him, allowing Mandy to take over, giving Billy someone new to provide brains for. Ironic, how it's Billy providing the brain power in this episode. 
In the first episode of season two, Toad Blatt's School of Sorcery, a bored Billy and Mandy are annoyed over the fact that they're going to two different and two stupid summer schools. Fat Math Camp and, bear with me, this is a mouthful, Happy Girls Fun Camp of Joy and Niceness. Grimm hears this and has an idea. He knows a summer school called Toad Blatt's School of Sorcery, and better yet, the bus is here. Well, sometimes things just work out. Billy and Mandy need to be sorted into magical houses by a sorting squid hat. There's something kind of familiar about this. Man, I mean empty! His head's as hollow as a coconut! Billy and Mandy get sorted into Weaselthorpe, the worst house in the entire school, where the deadbeats and the dropouts go. Grimm, meanwhile, gets given a job as prefect of another house, Gunderstank, the most prestigious house on campus. And then we meet Nigel Planter, the class clown and assumed leader of Weaselthorpe. Nigel tells Mandy that they dream of winning the house cup, but never can, because the dean hates them and Gunderstank have better witches, warlocks, and wizards. After hearing this, Mandy suggests that sabotage is the only way to get back at the house and the dean, and to finally give Weaselthorpe the house cup. Sabotage like causing Gunderstank to blow up Grimm and the dean. Sabotage is the best idea I've ever had! It was my idea. Breaking the dean's most beloved broomstick by unleashing a dragon and causing the dean to get eaten by a mythical monster. I have single-handedly sabotaged Gunderstank! And Weaselthorpe finally does it. They've won the house cup. Nigel Planter takes all the credit for Mandy's idea. Too much credit. But of course, pride before the fall as he blabs about being the best and sabotaging Gunderstank in front of the dean. So Nigel is sentenced to face the giant one-eyed dwarf. Yeah, you heard that right. Take credit where credit is due. In the episode, Love is Evil, spelled backwards, starts with Billy telling everyone that it's Valentine's Day. Lose your heads in the heat of passion. <laughs> Which means his mom and dad are off on a romantic fishing trip. Okay? Whilst they're away, Harold and Gladys have asked his aunt Sis to babysit, because she's a spinster. Which means, bit harsh, Gladys means she hasn't had anybody to love in her pathetic lonely life. Whilst Gladys is explaining what Sis's past is, it's revealed that someone is watching them from afar on a hidden camera around the home. It's none other than the nefarious Nurgle. He sees that Sis is desperate for companionship and wonders if she'll be desperate enough to settle for a lonely demon like him. She's a splinter cause she's got nobody. It doesn't take long for Nurgle to enter the fray. With his Nurglings, Grim, Billy, and Mandy thinks he's up to one of his evil schemes. Prepare for combat! Nope, he just has the hots for Billy's aunt. So much so that he kidnaps her, taking her on a fancy dinner date. Not bad as far as kidnappings go. The trio disguise themselves as a mariachi band to get close to Nurgle and Sis. Well, Mandy and Grimm, anyway. No matter what they do, the trio just can't seem to get Sis from Nurgle's clutches. Alas, all I can offer is my heart. Well, until Billy cuts a wasp's nest that lands perfectly into Nurgle's pants. But of course, it has the opposite effect. Nurgle tries to get rid of the painful bugs, but in doing so, looks like he's cutting shapes on a dance floor, which sparks some attraction in Sis for him. Well, okay, more than some attraction, as Sis confesses her love for Nurgle and agrees to marry him. Nephew. Racing back down to the center of the earth to live her new life with her new demonic husband. In the episode The Crawling Niceness, Billy walks in on Grimm and Mandy watching a bug documentary that freaks him out. So to distract him, he goes hunting in Grimm's trunk for sodies, where he stumbles on a giant green egg. I'm gonna hatch you right now. I just wait until. <laughs> A giant green egg containing a baby giant spider. Billy sees his new spider son and completely freaks out. Bubble! <gasps> Throwing it away and running back up to bed. But that doesn't last long, as Jeff, his gigantic spider son, is all grown up and comes to visit his dad with banana bread? Man, sometimes this show is so confusing. Billy hits Jeff over the head with the baked bread and sprints off to call Mandy for help and she comes around right away. But I'm not sure she realized just how big this bug is. Anyway, I didn't mean to interrupt. I'll just go finish alphabetizing your toys. <laughs> Grimm won't help Billy because he warned him about going into his trunk, and that's the price you pay for being a fool. Mandy, on the other hand, is willing to help Billy, but for a price. Billy's allowance for the next six months. However, not even Mandy can help, as Jeff kills her with kindness, knitting her a fancy sweater and sending her home. With no one left to help, Billy has to take matters into his own hands and tries to kill Jeff. This poor kitten is trapped under an overturned laundry basket. I'll save you, kitty. Only to nearly kill himself 
And if it wasn't for Jeff's quick-witted webbing, Billy might not have seen morning. Billy wakes up safe and sound, in Jeff's web, where he tells Jeff that all he dreams of is squishing him. Not the best thing a father can say to his son. And Jeff, being Jeff, agrees to get squished and calls an exterminator. Hello, exterminator? Yes, please send someone over right away. But Jeff is a bug too good to squish, and too good for Billy, and the exterminator takes him home to look after. Look, I made you a big batch of hotcakes! <laughs> Man, I love that kid. Following straight on, we have the episode Son of Nurgle. It seems the marriage is going well for Nurgle and Sis, as they welcome a baby egg into the world. A sentient talking egg that needs glasses? Nurgle tells his unborn son to go to camp and meet new kids, make some friends and start living life before he's even started living life. The son of Nurgle is on the lookout for a new body, when he stumbles across a boy playing by himself, and when the boy refuses to be friends, the son of Nurgle steals his body to hide in plain sight. Meanwhile, Billy and Mandy are also at winter camp, having to deal with the freezing conditions and a lumberjack turned drill sergeant for a camp counselor. Direct your attention to the small but cozy all wood accommodations. That's where I'll be staying. But where do we stay? Over there. Nobody better disturb me neither! Billy and Mandy try to settle into their freezing accommodation when they realize a spare bed, the bed that belongs to Nurgle Jr. He finds this place a little cold, though, and wants to be in the warmth, so Nurgle Jr. disturbs the counselor, which to anyone else would have been stupid. What? I'm cold. Well, of course you're cold! But when you're a half-demonic monster with endless abilities, it's not so dangerous. The next day, Billy and some other of the kids at camp find Junior working on a snowman suspiciously shaped like the camp counselor. When everyone notices Mindy, the most popular girl in Ennsville, when Junior finds her popularity interesting, so decides to steal her form. But no one seems to care, because Spurg, Ennsville's resident bully, has carved a motorcycle out of ice, and that's taken everyone's attention instead. And of course, Junior needs to take revenge. Mandy asks Billy if he's noticed anything weird going on, as all the kids have seemed to vanish from the camp and it's only them and Junior left. Suspicion grows, but nothing is said or done. Until later that night, when Billy chases a bunny with a candlelight. The bunny brings Billy to all the snowmen plotted around camp. Billy melts the snow with his candle, revealing all the frozen children planted there by Junior. Nurgle Jr. finds Billy looking at his frozen friends. He tells Billy they're just sleeping, and he wants Billy to be his bestest friend. Billy declines, however, saying Mandy is his only best friend. What about Grimm? Nurgle takes his words and morphs into Mandy, but Billy isn't impressed and tells Junior that Mandy doesn't wear glasses like a freak. This makes Junior go crazy, wrapping Billy up in his tentacles. But who comes to save the day? Mandy. She's ripped Junior's beloved bear, Mr. Bonkers, in half and demands the release of Billy, which Junior does. Going to be okay. I'll put you back together and <laughs> Mandy leaves as Junior cries about not having any friends, which applies to the good and Billy, who tells Junior he'll be his friend on the condition Junior is himself. Junior agrees, but warns Billy of how hideous he really is. But Billy insists it's okay. Until Nurgle Jr. reveals his true form, scaring Billy, who says he's never seen anything as ugly in his whole life. The bus from summer camp returns to Ennsville, dropping Billy off at home. Or does it? Okay, now we're into the good stuff. As Billy and Mandy's Jacked Up Halloween is the first feature-length episode of the series. The episode starts with Billy watching a scary movie by himself when a knock at the door startles him. He opens it to reveal Grimm and Mandy, dressed as Hamlet and technically Yorick. They remind Billy that it's Halloween, so Billy decides to go dressed as none other than the Grim Reaper. He borrows Grimm's scythe, but Grimm tells him to remember that one mistake when holding the scythe could bring about the end of the world, in unimaginably terrifying ways. Yeah, Billy should not have that much responsibility, Grimm. I'll be super careful. <laughs> Mandy, however, just wants to go trick-or-treating, and says to get on with it and ask questions later. The three go knocking at various doors around Ennsville, like at Irwin's house. The less said about that costume, the better. <laughs> After collecting candy all night, Grimm, Billy, and Mandy decide to eat the reward in a nearby cemetery, where Grimm recalls the story of the reason why people pull tricks on Halloween. Hundreds of years ago, when Ennsville was just a little village, it had a problem citizen, Jack, a notorious prankster who didn't know when to stop. It was said that he'd stay up through the night inventing various new pranks to pull on the people of Ennsville, laughing himself to sleep. The people of Ennsville got so tired of Jack, they devised a way to get back at him once and for all, pranking the Queen in his name. The Queen at the time was said to have no sense of humor whatsoever, but loved gifts. 
and on receiving the gift from Jack, decided he had to be taught a lesson. Grimm appeared to take Jack's soul. Yeah, you can imagine what the queen ordered. But Jack refused to let Grimm take him, stealing Grimm's scythe and refusing to give it back until he was granted eternal life. And Grimm had no choice but to grant Jack's wish. But as payback, cut off Jack's head so he will never be able to show his face in Ensville ever again. Would not be showing his face around town again, ever. Grimm tells Billy and Mandy that Jack is still out there. But instead of his own head, he has a pumpkin on his shoulders. And every Halloween night, he comes out of hiding to play terrible tricks on the people of Townsville. And he plays terrible pranks on the people of Innsville. The kids, however, don't believe Grimm's story and can't believe a pumpkin-headed prankster exists until Billy knocks on his door. That's right, of all the doors in Ensville, Billy had to knock on Jack's. Jack plays a prank on Billy but quickly tells him to leave. He likes me! And take his phony scythe as he's got real pranks to pull on people. An offended Billy tells Jack that this isn't any old scythe, this is the real deal and it even says so. Look, Jack's attention turns quickly to getting the scythe out of Billy's hands, and he does so easily. I mean, are you surprised? <laughs> Happy Halloween, you nutty kids! Jack then summons the spirits of the underworld, telling them to embody the millions of pumpkins he's readied for them, so they can cause chaos forever. Jack's Halloween minions destroy the city of Ensville. Yeah, that's what I call Halloween spirit. <laughs> An Halloween night seems likely that it'll never end, but he's not happy. What could be missing? Fresh air, good friends. He wants to take revenge on one more person, Grimm. Grimm, meanwhile, is trying to figure out what's going on. Hi, Mandy. Ever kiss a banana? That is, until Jack shows up and kidnaps him. Jack tells Grimm that he's ruined his life for 364 days of the year, and how he plans to cut off Grimm's head just like Grimm did to him all those years ago. Stupid idiot! Grimm's head is removable. Observe. As any head cut off with the Reaper's scythe stays off forever. That's a different story. Sorry, Grimm, old boy. Tough break. Jack prepares Grimm for the beheading, but Billy and Mandy show up to try to save him using pies and uh, dancing to trick Jack, but he doesn't fall for it. After all, he is the tricky trickster. Billy and Mandy have one final trick up their sleeve, bringing back the knight who attacked Jack on behalf of the queen. Uh, wait, nope, that's just Irwin. Irwin's misfortune is so hilarious it causes Jack and his evil pumpkin pals to laugh uncontrollably. <laughs> to the point that their bodies pop and their souls return back to the underworld. Jack's army disappears in seconds. But in his laughing fit, he's also misplaced the scythe, which is now back in Grimm's hands, and he sentences Jack to live eternity in the underworld. Now that's how you do a Halloween episode. In the episode, Spider's Little Daddy starts with Billy telling everyone just how much he hates bugs. Everything is spotless. And fears he's turning into a bug, so he takes himself to a public toilet to wash the bug off of him. Thick brown water. Ooh, the burn means it's working. Muttering to himself that he better not turn into a big bug like Jeff. Well, speaking of Jeff, it seems Billy is never too far away from his spider son. Daddy. As Jeff is sitting in his web listening to his dad talk bad about bugs. All Jeff wants is to show his dad, Billy, just how good of a son he can be. But meeting Billy face to face again isn't a good idea, as he runs away in fear of Jeff hitting his head and passing out. To be fair, imagine a massive spider calling you dad. You'd run. Mandy sees Jeff and offers him some advice to try and get on Billy's good side. Stop being so nice. I'll do it for a hundred bucks. A hundred bucks? Well, for you... 200. Jeff has tried every other trick in the book to get his dad to love him, so figures it can't hurt to try. So he asks Mandy to coach him in meanness. Mandy tells Jeff to go straight for it, to attack Billy so he's nowhere to hide. But instead of opening up and accepting Jeff, Billy just throws household items at him, which of course Jeff mistakes as gifts. Oh, Mandy. I can feel the warmth of daddy's love. Mandy has a plan B though, a headset that connects her and Jeff so she can feed mean things for him to say live to Billy, so Jeff can't mess it up. Mandy tells Jeff to get angry and mean. Right, a pebble. Oh, my eye! But instead of Mandy, Jim overhears Grimm's complaints about doing Mandy's chores and Jeff goes crazy. That's it. That's it. 
<laughs> Jumping into Billy's room demanding that his dad love him, and it's fair to say, it worked. It's just nice to have a father. How you doing, Dad? I love you. Remember way back at the beginning of the video when I mentioned that the show used to be called Grim and Evil? Well, the episode Scarred for Life brings the evil half to the town of Ensville in the form of General Scar. Scar is a former evil villain who worked alongside another villain called Hector Con Karn. But due to financial problems, their evil empire went bust, and now Scar has gone into retirement, moving into the house next door to Billy's. It isn't quite the quiet life that Scar had expected, as Billy won't stop annoying him. <laughs> to come in for a glass of water. Wow! Go into an old one-eyed weirdo's house? Why not? Hey, at least we know it isn't personal. Billy uncovers Scar's private study, which has a vast array of powerful weaponry, and he asks Scar why he has all these doodads laying around. Scar tells him about working with Hector Con Karn and all the evil things they did, and how they eventually got bought out by the entertainment industry. Billy tells Scar that his weapons aren't all that. That's not me anymore. I'm a good neighbor. I mow the lawn. I scrub the grout. I clip coupons. You ain't bad. You ain't nothing. <laughs> because Grimm has an all-powerful, magical scythe that can do anything. And if anyone stole it from him, they'd be the baddest of the bad. I think Billy is a bad influence on this super evil villain. It doesn't take Scar long to give in to his evil ways. Real corn makes it special. Who is this? Ultimate power. <laughs> as he sets a course to steal the scythe from Grimm. But I'm not sure this is how he imagined his battle with the Grim Reaper would go. The pretty Grim Reaper gives up their scythe easily, and Scar returns home victorious. But Mandy is waiting for him like a classic Bond villain, and she tells Scar that he has to follow her rules. And stealing from Grimm is stealing from her, intimidating him and making him cry. What are you? I'm just a pretty little our favorite wizarding world is back! Not that one, I'm talking about Toadblatt's School of Sorcery. The school makes its return in the episode Nigel Planter and the Chamber Pot of Secrets. The episode starts with Grimm playing a round of golf with Billy as his ball, hitting a shot through a house window. Nigel Planter's house window. Hold still and go along, man. I'm playing through. Grimm, Billy, and Mandy are confused as to why Nigel isn't at Toadblatt's, but he quickly tells them that he's being hunted by the darkest and most evil wizard of all time, Lord Moldybutt. Yeah, really. And that the mere mention of his name causes things to break randomly, like windows. Nigel begs the trio to help him in his quest to go back to sorcery school, but he needs their protection from the Dark Lord. They teleport into the Dean's office, who seems overjoyed that Nigel's back but only because he wants Nigel to enjoy what time he has left before his impending demise. Before Lord What's-His-Name gets a hold of him and... You mean Lord Moldy Butt? The three guard Nigel at night, or at least try to, but their efforts go to waste as Lord Moldy Butt climbs through the castle window without anyone noticing. He grabs Nigel and tells him to stay away from the Chamber Pot of Secrets or else. But I don't even know where the Chamber Pot of Secrets is! It's in the Dean's office, behind the... Wait, no. Before being chased out of the castle by Mandy, the Dark Lord tells Nigel as he leaves that he hasn't seen the last of him. <laughs> Whilst at school, Lord Moldybutt comes face to face with Nigel and once again tells him to stay away from the Chamber Pot of Secrets. No sign of Lord Moldybutt. Man, he really doesn't want Nigel getting to that pot, does he? and stay away from the chamber pot of secrets. The Dean calls Nigel into his office and tells him that the school can no longer be responsible for his safety, and it would be better for everyone if he just packed his bags and got on his way. But who appears in the Dean's office but Lord Moldybutt? The Dark Lord reveals himself to be Mandy, who says she's been in the chamber pot of secrets and found a suit, the same suit the Dean has been using to terrify Nigel to get him out of sorcery school. FBI crime lab in Quantico, Virginia confirmed that Dean Toadblatt was the culprit. And he would have gotten away with it too if it wasn't for those meddling kids and their grim reaper. The gang think everything is done and dusted and settle down to play a round of golf laughing about the existence of Lord Moldybutt. Well, they won't be laughing long as deep underground cooking a mischievous mixture is none other than Lord Moldybutt himself. Soon you will see the true power of Lord Moldybutt. 
Easy, but... <laughs> In the episode of Bully Boogie, we're introduced to yet another supernatural supervillain, the Boogeyman. Although, the Boogeyman seems to be a failing evildoer, as he's just not that scary anymore. He thinks back and reminisces about his old school days and remembers Grimm. The two had a scary rivalry, each thinking they were scarier than the other. Boogie decides to go and visit his old school friend. <laughs> oh, shut up! I'm trying to sleep! Grimm to try to recapture the glory days. Grimm is in the middle of baking when Boogie bursts into the house and sits down, making himself right at home. Grimm tells Erwin, Billy, and Mandy that Boogie was the worst bully in history, and he lived to make everyone else's lives miserable. Let's all point and laugh at his humiliation! <laughs> but Boogie doesn't stay long enough to hear it and kidnaps Billy, taking him down to the underworld. Grimm sees Red and tells Mandy he's had enough of Boogie and it's time he taught him a lesson he'll never forget. So he rips a portal open to the underworld, jumping through it, and Mandy quickly follows. Hmm. Not the soda. Not the purple stuff. Grimm and Boogie clash again over old times, with Grimm claiming he's scarier than Boogie. Their argument is stopped quickly, though, by Mandy, who offers them a way to see who really is the most terrifying, by having a scare-off. If Grimm wins, Boogie stops scaring and returns Billy safe and sound. And if Boogie wins, he becomes the Boogie Reaper, taking Grimm's job. The two decide just how they'll scare the kid in question. Boogie chooses the form of a werewolf, while Grimm chooses a rubber duck. The kid they're going to scare is in the bath, getting squeaky clean. When Boogie appears from under the water in his werewolf form, trying to scare the kid. But instead, he sees a puppy dog and hugs Boogie. This is the opposite of being scared. But the bubbles don't stop, and Grimm's duck surfaces, quacking. With each quack, the rubber duck grows, and its voice deepens until it turns into a huge duck monster with the head of Grimm, scaring the little boy near to death. Grimm wins, forcing Boogie into eternal hiding in the underworld. In the episode Chocolate Sailor, Grimm is selling his old comic books at a garage sale. Too cheap to buy this cheesy crud! When Billy starts reading one, he notices an advert called The Chocolate Sailor. The ad comes to life and tells Billy to join the Chocolate Sailor dinghy crew. Says comic books aren't good for you. A team of, well, chocolate salesmen. In return for selling the sailor's chocolate, Billy is promised a bountiful booty, which for Billy is impossible to turn down. Billy returns home to find his chocolate selling kit and his first order of chocolates waiting for him to sell to hungry customers. But Billy, being Billy, doesn't sell the mythical chocolate, he eats it. All of it. Only to luckily find another order of fresh chocolate awaiting him once again on his doorstep. I never accept candy from strangers. But Mandy, it's me, Billy! Exactly. Surely, Billy won't make the same mistake twice, uh, of course he does. Billy eats himself stupid if that's possible, with case after case of chocolate. Good news, sir! Sales are way up! Thanks to our top salesman, Billy! It's not long before Billy and Mandy try to find their chocolate-loving chum, but when they go to see Billy, they find him in a chocolate coma and looking surprisingly chocolatey. Grimm recognizes the chocolate sailor's name and warns Billy about eating himself. As if he doesn't stop, he'll die. The three set on finding the chocolate sailor, as only he has the antidote, but he seems a hard man to pin down. With information from some bar folk, the three set sail to look for the chocolate sailor. He must be very difficult to find. Nah, he's about two offs over. You can take my dinghy. And it turns out he wasn't that hard to find after all. He invites the trio on board his ship. The sailor offers Billy an assortment of enchanted chocolates, and only one chocolate contains the antidote. The flavors are caustic caramel cream, horrific hazelnut, mutating marshmallow, or antidote. Well, it doesn't matter with Billy, as he eats the entire box, causing him to explode in chocolatey goo. He's in a better place. I like chocolate! The episode Wishbone starts with Grimm finding an ancient, alive, and rhyming skull in his freshly washed robe. This isn't just any sentient skull, though. This is Thrumnambular, a magical artifact from outside of time and space, imprisoned on Earth until he grants another nine wishes. On his toenails. Grimm says that using the skull's wishes will only backfire in some unforeseen way, and he'd rather have what he's got, rather than risk it all on a backfiring wish. Ooh, I bet he's a football helmet! <laughs> Billy, of course, wishes away, wanting to be an internationally known adventurer. Billy is whisked away into a wish world to live out his wish forever. Why are you talking funny? Be 
because I am from Calcutta. Harold is next on the agenda when it comes to wishing, asking Thrumnambular to grant him the chance to relive his cool high school years, where Harold ruled high school. And Thrumnambular does as asked, warping him into his high school years. Feel like partying with a wild man? Who you calling a lady, buddy? It's not long before our favorite sentient skull makes his way to more people than just Billy and Harold. As General Scar makes an appearance and a wish, Scar wishes to be Lord Highmaster and ruler of the world, which of course is granted. Scar should have been careful what he wishes for though, as the high part of his wish gets the better of him. General Scar! It's time for Irwin now to get in on Thrumnambular's power. He wishes to be in a hip-hop video, but just like the rest, Irwin's wish soon pops like a balloon. Careful what you wish for. More and more people find the power of Thrumnambular. Wow, I'm getting really good at saying that name. Put in. <laughs> Nurgle Jr. Now I know what I want. I wish. Oh. Spur. Mindy, each of them having backfiring wishes that leaves them worse off than when they started. That's not what I meant by becoming a star! Big stupid! But now there's only one wish left to grant, and one person to grant it to, Mandy. Mandy tries to auction off her wish instead of using it, and she too knows just how powerful wishes can be and what consequences wait. A mass panic ensues with the general public tries to take the skull and its last wish, leaving Grimm to shout at Billy and Mandy, saying he wishes that they never found the skull, and Thromnambular grants it, sending us back to the beginning of the episode before he was found, and before any wishes were granted. The episode Duck starts with Grimm coming home to his, uh, wife, and snuggling down after a long hard day reaping souls when we get one of the most famous scenes in the show's history. I haven't lived down that nickname yet, have I, Billy? Billy? Uh, I mean, baby! Grimm starts to realize that this house and wife may not be all that it seems. Same as it ever was! Same as it ever was! Same as it ever was! Stop saying that! Of course, Grimm is dreaming, but not just any dream, a nice dream. He tells Billy that it's not good that he's had a nice dream, for when he does, it always means a supernatural being has been let loose into the real world, using his mind as a bridge, and the supernatural being that has crossed over this time is a phantom duck. I didn't find anything too unusual. Except for this. Okay, look, I can explain. Only Grimm can see the phantom duck, though, which confuses him. But this duck isn't just invisible. It also blows raspberries, making it look like Grimm is farting. Pretty highbrow humor, huh? I am the Grimm. That's it. The duck follows Grimm everywhere, blowing raspberries around anyone he meets, embarrassing him and making everyone feel uncomfortable. Even when Grimm's trying to do some work, he can't get any peace from this new duck menace. I have come for you! <laughs> a group of kids see a glum Grimm and try to cheer him up by giving him some cola, but right on cue, the duck blows a raspberry, sending the kids running away. Grimm makes matters worse when he undresses himself in a park, getting him arrested for indecent exposure. How do you put handcuffs on a skeleton? Well, things go from bad to worse as he's locked up with a cellmate who was arrested for beating up another man because he farted. Irwin then shows up at the jailhouse to give bail money to get Grimm out of there, but he only brought $4 and the bail is set at $3,500. Well, it was the thought that counts. Sorry, Grimm! Yeah, you'd better run! As Irwin is leaving and waiting for his dad to collect him, he notices the phantom duck is standing by his side now, following him. He gets into his dad's car and just like with Grimm, the duck blows a raspberry, making it look like Irwin is farting. It's not long before Irwin and his family also end up in jail as they break wind during a minute's silence. We observed a moment of silence. And just like Grimm, as soon as Irwin is imprisoned, the duck moves on to his next victim, Harold, who also ends up in jail. Hey, a duck! What the heck just happened? As does the rest of Ensville. I'm not even on this stupid show anymore! The demon duck moves on to its final victim, Mandy, going through the same fake farting routine as he has with every other person, which of course gets her in trouble. And he was like, mm -hmm. and so I was all like, uh. <laughs> and then what? 
<laughs> Mandy ends up in Principal Good Vibes' office. Yeah, that's his real name. The principal is called to other matters, and as soon as he steps foot out of the door, the demon duck uses the PA to sound farts across the entire school. And Mandy isn't phased at all. She tells the duck it has no power over her and to beat it, which it does. No more demon duck, all thanks to Mandy. Actually, he disappeared after the first day. Then that means... The episode Keeper of the Reaper introduces us to one of the most famous and love him or hate him characters in the show's history, Fred Fredberger. As I say that name, I know some of you are either groaning or cheering. Fred Fredberger is a small, chubby, bright green elephant-like monster who lives with his mom and is a regular juror in Underworld Court. The episode begins with us seeing a normal day of Fred Fredberger and his first ever court appearance. The court case he'll be on is none other than Billy and Mandy's custody of Grim Case. The two are in a legal battle after Billy's dad, Harold, has been given a work transfer to another city. We get to move to a new town and leave behind everything that has meaning to you. And Billy wants to take Grimm, but Mandy won't let him, saying that Grimm is more so her friend than Billy's, and that if anyone should keep Grimm, it's her. I'll see you in court. Wrong court. In court, which is overseen by Judge Roy Spleen, several witnesses are called, including Irwin, Jeff the Spider, Lil Porkchop, Mindy, Claire, Philip, and for some reason, Major Dr. Gasly. The proceedings are constantly disrupted by Fred, who irritates Judge Spleen with a barrage of random questions and statements. I order you to shut up! Judge, I won't do shut up! After a musical interlude involving the whole courtroom, Spleen tries to settle the dispute while Fred is in the toilet. Spleen asks the jury to vote for either Billy or Mandy, but a tiebreak ensues, leaving Fred as the tiebreaker juror. Yes to Billy, or yes to Mandy? Yes! Spleen realizes with the, I guess you could say help, of Fred that Grimm shouldn't be separated from Billy or Mandy, as it would destroy their friendship. As a result, Spleen rules that Billy and his family will be placed under house arrest and never be allowed to leave Ensville, essentially giving Mandy custody of Grimm. In the episode Be a Fred, Be Very a Fred, Grimm finds himself in a commercial for a laxative brand, and to make things even stranger, he announces an essay contest where the winner gets to spend a day with him, which weirdly he's excited about. Contest rules on each pill. Enter today. The doorbell rings, and who's at the door? It's none other than Fred Fredberger, who doesn't wait long before annoying everyone around him by trying to spell his name or pointing out that Mandy has no nose. Grimm tries to send Fred away, but it turns out Fred is the contest winner. He he hands over his entry, and all Fred wants is to enjoy some frozen yogurt with his hero, the Grim Reaper. Whoa! But Grim decides to head to the Underworld, believing it's a mistake that Fred won, and asks the kids to keep an eye on Fred whilst he's away. In the Underworld, Grim demands to see the other contest entries, and a mountain of essays is dropped on him. However, his enthusiasm is cut short when he realizes that all the essays say the same thing, I want to eat some frozen yogurt. It turns out that Fred had written every single entry and was the only contest entrant. The company executives inform Grimm that the laxative brand sales have plummeted, because people don't want a product associated with death. Whose dumb idea was it to hire you, anyways? Grimm pleads for one last chance, promising to make Fred's day so great it will be a public relations success. The executives issue a stern warning. If Grimm fails, he'll be fired and beaten senseless. Man, that is harsh. Grimm, Fred, Billy, and Mandy find themselves in an Ensville frozen yogurt shop. Fred struggles to choose yogurt flavors because of course he does. What toppings on that, sir? What kind of all of the toppings? Eventually, he settles on chocolate and mint. As Fred enthusiastically enjoys his yogurt, Mandy and Billy become annoyed with the chaos he creates, and Grimm decides to capture the moment with a photo. But Fred's obsession with his yogurt ruins the picture. After a series of mishaps, including Billy's interference and Fred's yogurt disaster, Fred has an emotional breakdown and hides in the freezer. Now, take it. Hey, can I be in the pit? Dang it, Billy! Believing Grimm killed his yogurt. Desperate to salvage the day, Grimm turns to Mandy for help, who writes an essay stating that Fred also wanted to visit Sassy Cat Land. With encouragement from Billy and Mandy about the fun rides and delicious snacks at Sassy Cat Land, Fred emerges from the freezer and happily joins them. However, his hyperactive behavior leads to trouble on one of the spinning rides. I'm so happy to hear you enjoying yourself. Holy moly! <laughs>
causing Grimm to get in trouble with the company executives once again. Grimm is ultimately fired and subjected to a series of comical punishments. Fred, luckily, as fine as he was rescued from a snowdrift by a Yeti, who takes him to a place where everyone sounds like Fred and there's an abundance of nachos and frozen yogurt. Okay, I guess uh, everybody wins. Well, apart from Grimm. It's that sad time again. Final episode time. But don't worry, we're about to go out with a bang as the final episode of The Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy is a doozy. The episode is titled Heartburn and starts with Billy once again snooping around Grimm's secret trunk, finding the underworld's true heart camera, a camera that shows the true essence of someone's heart. The camera reveals dark secrets about the most innocent people on the planet, like Irwin. Billy snaps a picture of Irwin showing him to be a secret evil villain. surprises there. Well, evil enough for Mandy to want to talk to him. Erwin tells Mandy that he was born bad and has a secret past. Mandy doesn't believe Erwin's stories as he's gotten far too nice now. Yeah, you screaming baby. And his heart has grown three sizes since his dark days and warns Mandy that maybe her true heart is about to change too. Maybe Mandy will become nice? Mandy's condition begins to get worse as she starts to become nice. Why would we want the old Mandy back? Like saying Grimm and Billy are good friends, she even kisses Erwin. But that's a step too far, as he burps when they embrace, shocking her true heart back to being mean. Erwin confesses that he did it on purpose, as he loves Mandy the way she is. Not what she was turning into. Mean Mandy is here to stay. And that is the last ever episode of The Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy. But our favorite trio didn't quite stop there, as shortly after the final episode aired, it was announced that a TV movie would be released, Billy and Mandy's Big Boogie Adventure. And of course, I'm gonna cover it. The film starts with Grimm being stripped of his powers by the underworld court due to the boogeyman suing for misuse of his powers after he put a hole in General Scar's body. I wonder what this one does? Grimm, Billy, Mandy, and Irwin are set to be exiled. I want to plead guilty! Shut up! And number three of The Kids Next Door becomes the new Grim Reaper. Random crossover, but this is the mid-2000s. Boogie's main plan is to get rid of Grimm and then steal the horror's hand, an object capable of transforming its holder into the scariest and most powerful being in existence. The group eventually escape and meet up again, making plans to obtain the hand for themselves for various reasons. One candy bar, please. Both groups eventually reach where the hand is held, and they are forced into a race by horror, a living statue that cut off its hand and placed his fears within it. Row, row ye scurry dog. Grimm's group wins the race, and they eventually find the hand, but Boogie gets a hold of the hand first before being eventually defeated when he learns that he is, again, not scary. We coulda told you that after his last appearance. Later on, Boogie suffers from many injuries and develops a mental block which causes him to be afraid of everything around him. Ironic much? Afterwards, Grimm gets his old job back and the group learns that they had gotten everything that they wanted without having the hand. In the end, a naked, cut-up Billy comes from two weeks in the future to warn that if Mandy had used Horror's hand, she would have taken over the world in two weeks. Future Billy eventually goes back to the future to make sure that things were set right. I like that guy. And finds that Fred Fredberger somehow stole Horror's hand from Grimm's magic trunk and took over the world as the new Lord of Horror. I like nachos. What a way to close the curtain on this very strange, wonderful series. So now that is the full recap of The Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy. I hope you've had as much supernatural fun as I have. And of course, thank you all so much for watching. Make sure to like, subscribe, share with your friends, and all that good stuff. Let us know down below what show you'd like for us to see next. See you all next time. Bye-bye.